Hi, my name is Sebastian Matteau and today I would like to talk to you about list comprehensions in Python. Now, this is the first of a four-part video about different kinds of comprehensions in Python. Uh, but we'll start about with, uh, with list comprehensions because they're the most commonly used form of a comprehension. So what is a comprehension? Let's start actually with what is a list. A list in Python, you probably know this, is a collection of elements, right? There are multiple things in a list. And a list has a few properties. Namely, it is ordered, so the elements in the list have a predictable order that you can rely upon as a programmer. And the list is mutable, meaning that you can change its contents. You can add something to a list and remove something to, from a list. Right? So those are the basic properties of a list. Now, if you would create a list in Python, in many cases, if you don't use a list comprehension, what you would do is you would create an empty list first, and then you have some kind of for loop. And in that for loop, you gradually add things to that list until you are... Uh, you are happy with the list that you've created. And a list comprehension is essentially a way to do the same thing, to build a list, um, but to do it without an explicit for loop in a single expression. Um, that sounds a little bit abstract, but I will make it concrete in this video with a few examples. And I will also show you some different approaches to, so to, to solving the same uh, class of problems uh, with a list comprehension or with different uh, techniques. So let's take a look at the data that we're going to work with. Uh, the example data, I will load it in here. By the way, if you're wondering what I'm working in, uh, this is a so-called Jupyter Lab uh, notebook, or an I a sort of new generation of an IPython notebook, which allows you to combine uh, code, Python code, as you see here, with, uh, with text, as you see here. It's quite convenient, Jupyter Lab, you can look it up. Um, so what do we have? What is the data that we're going to work with? Well, I have some numbers of the world's population from 1500 until now-ish. And you see that in 1500, there were only about half a billion people on Earth. And nowadays, there are a little bit more than about 7 billion people on Earth. Now, what are we going to do with this data? First thing that we're going to do is we're going to filter it. We're going to only look at those populations that are larger than the population threshold of 1 billion. In other words, we're only going to consider the three last populations from 1900 and later, right? Because then there were more than 1 billion people on Earth. So that's one element. We're going to filter this list. The second element is that we're going to transform this list. Uh, more specifically, we're going to express these populations as in locust units. So with this to locust units function, what does that do? Well, we have here, we have a number, constant locust plague population, 30 billion. Those are the number of grasshoppers, the number of locusts, right? The locust is a grasshopper that tends to plague, that tends to become gregarious. Uh, the number of grasshoppers that can be in a very big locust plague, about 30 billion. So what we're going to do is express the world's population as a proportion of a locust plague. So for example, the 6 billion here from 1999 uh, would be about 0.2 because 6 billion is about 20% of the 30 billion of our locust plague. So we're going to do two, th do two things. Filter uh, based on our population threshold and then transform uh, into a proportion of a locust plague. Now we're going to see a few different ways in which we can do that. And we'll start with the most traditional way, just a for loop. And you're probably familiar with this. So if we want to create a list in a for loop, we generally start with an empty list, I will call it L. And then we say, okay, for the populations in the world population, right? So for P in the world's population. Then we want to consider only if some elements from this list. So we can say, okay, uh, if the population is smaller than the population threshold, then we're actually not interested in that population. So we continue, right? The continue statement skips the rest of the for loop. It does not break the for loop entirely, not like a break statement, but it skips this particular iteration of the for loop. Um, but for all things that are larger than or equal to the population threshold, what we're going to do is apply the two locust units function to our P that will create some kind of proportion of that population in locust uh, units. And we're going to append that to our list L. And then we will print it out so you can see what comes out. So I'll run it. And you see what comes out. Okay, 0.055. What is that? Well, that is the, the number from 1900 in locust units, right? So 1 billion or 1.6 billion is about 5% of locust plague until 0.235, right? So the 7 billion from 2012 is about 23-24% uh, of a locust plague. And who knows, maybe at some point the, the world's population will exceed that of a big locust plague. But we'll have some, uh, we still have some growing uh, to do. 
Okay, so this is a traditional for loop, and I, I'm assuming that you more or less understand how this works, right? You simply create an empty list L, you loop through all the things that you want to sort of process and add to that list, you use an if statement to filter the things that you're interested in, right? So in this case, if, if, it, if the population is smaller than the threshold, we're not interested, we continue. For the things that we are interested in, we apply the toLocust units function, and we append the result to our list, and we print it out. This is fine, this is traditional, this is quite easy to understand. But we can do the same thing with the list comprehension in a way that I think is still quite easy to understand and is a little bit more elegant. So how does a list comprehension work? It sounds really magical, but you will see that it's not. So we start with square brackets, because the square brackets indicate that it's a listy thing, right? Square brackets indicate list to Python, generally speaking. And inside of that list comprehension, we type something that resembles a for loop, but it's not really a for loop for p in world population. So this really looks like a for loop, right? Now, what are we going to do with all those p's? Well, we're going to apply the two locus units function. But two locus units p for p in world population. And this is almost plain English, right? So we can, and this is a valid list comprehension. This works. What does this give? Well, this immediately gives us a list that we can assign to L. So what we're doing here is say, okay, for p in the world's population, apply the two locus units function and the resulting elements, wrap those in the list and assign it to L. And if I print it out, you will see that this works. And it is a pretty sweet way to express that kind of logic on a single line using a list comprehension. It's very easy to read, but we're still missing the filtering component. So we've built our first valid list comprehension here, right? It's very easy to understand, but it's not filtering yet. So how do we add filtering to a list comprehension? What I'll do first is divide this list comprehension over multiple lines. That is just aesthetics, right? It just makes it a little bit easier to read, but it spreads, the, it makes it semantically easier to understand, I would say, because it makes it easier to see that, okay, this is the loopy part of our list comprehension for P in world population. This is the transforming part, the operating part of our list comprehension. And now we need to add a filtering part to our list comprehension. The filtering part always comes at the end and it is, starts with an if statement. And it is again almost plain English. You say if the p is larger or equal than our population threshold, um, then w that is our filtering criteria. If I run it, you see that now we get these three elements that are the same as the three elements here. And in fact, this list comprehension is uh, semantically equivalent to our for loop here above. So what does this do? Well, it says, okay, let's go through the entire all the world populations. We're only going to consider those p's that are larger than or equal to the population threshold. And for those, we're going to apply the two locus units function. And the, the result, we wrap into a new list, and that's our list comprehension, and we assign that to L. So it's a very sweet, very easy to read uh, logic that we have expressed here on these three lines, right? We could express it also on a single line, but because it becomes a little bit long, I, ex I prefer to express it over multiple lines. Now this is a list comprehension. This is essentially all there is to know about a list comprehension. You have the loopy part with the for, you can optionally have the filtery part with an if statement, and of course there's something that you do with the elements of the list, namely in this case apply the two locus units function. So this is a list comprehension. Now what I want to do is also show how you can do this with map and filter functions. Not because I personally am such a big fan of map and filter, but because they are classic computer science functions and you will see them sometimes used by people in Python um, who are used to working with map and filter, but you will also see them in many different programming languages uh, which don't have uh, uh, list comprehensions in the same way that Python does. So even if I don't necessarily recommend using map and filter, or not always, um, it's, it's important to understand how they work and to recognize them uh, if you see them. So how can we express this exact same logic using map and filter? Well, let's start with map. What does map do? Let's say m equals map. Map is a function that takes two arguments. The first argument is a function that we're going to apply uh, to our list. What is that function? In our case, that's two locus units. The second uh, argument to map is the thing that we want to transform, the list that we want to transform, so the world population. What does it return? If I print out m, you will see that it actually returns a map object, not a list. Uh, so a special kind of iterable object for Python, but we can quite easily convert that to a list by passing it to the list function and the list function will turn it into a list. And if I run this, you will see that this essentially does the same thing 
as our list comprehension, of course, except for the filtering. Right? So it, it takes every element from the world population and applies the two locus units function. So how can we combine this with filtering? Well, then we need the filter function. So I will divide this over two lines again to make it a little bit easier to read. And now we need to, instead of uh, applying map to the world population, what we need to do is uh, apply map to the result of a filter. So we call filter. And a filter, like map, takes two functions, uh, two arguments. The first argument is a function the filtering function that indicates for every element whether it should be included or not. So, um, well, how can we say that? Let's assume that we have a function is big enough that indicates, that takes a particular population and checks whether it is big enough for us to be interested in, and it applies that to the world's populations. Then we need to define our if is big enough function, right? We say, oh, we say def is big enough, it takes a population p, and it says, well, it's big enough when, well, if p is larger than or equal to our population threshold. If I run this, you will see that now we have something that is equivalent to what we did above, but much less readable, right? In my opinion, this combination of map and filter is not nearly as readable as our list comprehension here. But how does this work? Well, we take every element from the world population, check whether it is big enough. The result becomes something that resembles a list, a filter object. That is passed through the map, and map will apply the two locus units func function to every element uh, of that filtered list, return a map object, and that's what we print out here after casting it to a list. Okay. So the point of showing this map and filter is not because I necessarily recommend that you use it, as I said before, but because it is important to understand how it works and to recognize it when you encounter it. But I think a list comprehension in Python is much sweeter, much easier to read, uh, approach to that particular problem. Okay, so now we know a lot about list comprehensions and we've also seen two alternative imp implementations, a regular for loop and a map filter combination. Uh, what I want to do now is look at a slightly more complicated scenario, namely nested list comprehensions. Now what is a nested comprehension? Uh, let's consider a very prototypical scenario where we have a list of x-coordinates and a list of y-coordinates, in this case three, three x-coordinates and three y-coordinates, and we want to combine those uh, so that we end up with a grid of nine elements, right? So we want to get every possible combination of this x and these x and these y-coordinates. How can you do that? I'll load this in. Well, we can do that with the nested for loop in a very simple way, right? Most people would probably solve this with the nested for loop, and it would go something like this. We create an empty list, L, then we loop to our x-coordinates for x in x-coordinates. Then we loop to our y-coordinates for our y in y-coordinates. And then we append to our list a tuple that has the x and the y-coordinates. And then we print it out, print L. Up, there we go. Then we get a list of all, a list of nine elements, and those nine elements correspond to all possible combinations of the x and the y-coordinates, right? This is a nested loop. I think you understand how this works. Right, so we have the outer loop x that loops through all x coordinates, the inner loop y that loops through all y coordinates, and then we append to our list the combination of the x and the y coordinate. And that's what we print out. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. And actually, it's quite readable, right? So this is, this is okay. Um, well, we can do the same thing with the nested list comprehension. And that, in my opinion, is not so easy to read. So I don't necessarily recommend doing this, but it's, again, important to understand how it works. Semantically, it's again very similar to, um, it, it looks quite similar to a nested for loop. What we have is first our outer loop for x in x coordinate, then our inner loop for y in y coordinate. And then what do we want to have? Well, we want to have the tuple that corresponds, the tuple of the x and the y, and that's what we print out. But there we go. And you see it prints out this is exactly the same as this, right? So this list comprehension is a very, um, short and concise way to express this nested for loop. But to me, if I read this, it is always a little bit confusing how the loops relate to each other, right? It is, now I know because I prepared this video, I realized that this is the outer loop, the X, and this is the inner loop. But I get these two flipped around quite often and I do not find this very, very readable, right? So I would not necessarily recommend using nested list comprehensions unless you have a particular reason or unless you, you personally find this quite easy to read. But I personally find it a little bit tricky. But they exist. You can have nested loops in list comprehensions. 
Then I also want to show for this particular scenario a different kind of solution. So Python has, an, has, a, has a module that's called iterTools, import iterTools. And iterTools has a lot of functions that you can apply to lists and other iterable objects. And many of these kinds of scenarios, for example, if you have a list of x coordinates and a list of y coordinates, there are functions in iterTools that actually solve that problem for you. And when it's there, why not use it? And in the case of iterTools, we have iterTools.product that will create every possible combination of whatever you pass to it, so our x coordinates and our y coordinates. What does it what does it return? P. Let's print it out. You will see it actually returns a product object. So if we want to have a list, then we need to explicitly convert this to a list with the list function, as we did before with the map for the also for the map uh, object. But then if you run it, you will see it does exactly the same thing. Um, and it result, re returns exactly the same uh, loop that we have, have here above. Right? So, um, of course, iterTools.product tool, cannot do everything that a nested list comprehension can, but in, for this particular scenario, it does exactly what you want to, uh, to do. So in that case, I would use iterTools.product. Okay, now, so we've seen, now we've learned a lot about list comprehensions in Python and also incidentally learned a few other techniques along the way. Let's review what a list comprehension is. Right here we have the traditional list comprehension. A list comprehension is indicated by these square brackets, right, indicating that it's a listy thing, and it has a few components. It has a loopy component for p in the world population. This is where we do the looping. We have an optional filtering component. We're only interested in those p's that are larger than or equal to the population threshold. And for those p's, we apply the two locust units function, and the result is wrapped into a list and assigned to L, and we print it out. And then in this case, we get our uh, resulting list. Very nice. We've also looked at nested list comprehensions in which we have an outer loop and an inner loop um, that allows us to essentially create a product, you could say, of two, uh, two, uh, two different lists. And in this case, we used it to combine uh, all possible X and Y coordinates uh, to create a grid of X and Y coordinates. But as I said, I think for a nested list comprehension, we're getting kind of into, into territory where things become a little bit difficult to read. And I would personally prefer to either use an explicit nested for loop, which is to me easier to read, or use some kind of a predefined helper function such as iterTools.product. Now with that, thank you very much for your attention. In the next video, we're going to take a look at dict comprehensions, which are quite similar to list comprehensions, but as the name suggests, operate on dict objects. Um, thank you very much.